And uh, I guess I have a question. Did any of you want ice on the road outside your house? Did, or did you? No, not ice at There's a lot of water, of course, to yeah. the ice came from the car. For I saw the cars all I had to do. Uh, just a little bit. It's just the way my street is angled. So I had to warm up. I had to get up and down. It's just more of my steps. It, it seemed like you know, starting at noon was a bit extreme, but I, I don't know what's going on north of the town. Just like electric forces for two charges and electric field is for one charge. Electric forces for two charges, electric fields for one charge. Yeah. Okay. One charge creates an electric field, but you can have but in order to have a force you need two charges. Got it. At least. Uh, the constant that we stick on at the end is not medium related. It is related about where you want zero to be. Okay. Because crude, what ultimately matters is the change in potential energy, not the actual value itself. to ask for anyone it doesn't have to be anyone else but uh, can you show some more examples of how drawing the lines on like the lab kind of thing drawing the lines on the lab yeah uh, well the electric field. Oh, oh, oh the electric field ones okay the part of the lab you did not do yep so i've got a positive side and a negative side. Although I suspect it was reversed, but. All right, so the, what you measure directly are, are the, is the potential. You had one probe on the negative, which does not necessarily mean it's negative potential, it just means it's a lower potential than this is. So you put one lead on the negative and the other one at various places to figure out what the potential difference was between the two. Now I use the term potential difference, I could have also said voltage, since the electric potential difference is the same thing as voltage. So if I ever ask you the question of what's the voltage between two points, and then my next question is what's the electric potential difference, it's the same question. And if you find the actual potential lines in a nice ideal case, then it should be you know, relatively flat in between, and then it will curve around like that, a little less curving the closer you get to the middle. The middle should be somewhat straight. So those are roughly the equipotential lines. In other words, every point on here would have the exact same potential difference between that point on the line and a reference point, which in our case was down here. The electric field lines are perpendicular to the equipotential lines. That should always be the case. So in the middle, it's relatively easy. It's just going to boom. It's also easy because I drew nice ideal lines. I'll throw in bizarre line in just a moment to start off with a simple case. As we get, I also know that the electric field is perpendicular to the conductor. Now, in the case of a point charge, you know, you're just going away from the point, and that's, you know, if you consider the, the point charge is just an incredibly tiny sphere. So as long as you're going away from that point, it counts as perpendicular. 
So here the electric field is both perpendicular, and here the electric field is perpendicular, there perpendicular. Those would be the direction of the electric field at the point at the conductor over here. You know, what happens in between is the trickier part. So let's take this one, for example. It comes out perpendicular to the surface. So perpendicular to the lines and perpendicular to the surface of the conductor. I guess I should throw the extra restrictions to perpendicular to surface of conductor in the electrostatic equilibrium. I know ultimately my electric field line is going from positive to negative, so whatever I, so when I'm coming out here, I know I'm gonna to have to go over to there. So I have something, I have an erasable medium here, so I can just nicely, I know it's gonna to start to curve. I'll just extend my line here a little bit. And I'm looking to see that that is a right angle. Actually, technically, it is a right angle to a tangent line on the curve at that moment, at that point. Something like that. I'm a little bit off right there. But at least I have a first draft in terms of, let's say, you're doing the lab and you're and you're trying to draw it, that's at least a first draft. I'll go ahead and extend this one. So this one's not quite a right angle, that one's not quite a right angle. In order to get a right angle, this one needs to straighten out, that one needs to straighten out. So, you know, if I came out farther before cut, cutting down, that looks better. That looks better. Much closer to a right angle when it crosses those the actual potential lines. And so that's roughly the way you do it. And then once I had you know dotted and I feel comfortable that it's hitting all the actual potential lines at a right angle, I would then fill it in solid. Now, I drew some nice equipotential lines here, but let's say that you have something bizarre. And I have some positive source here and some negative source there. I drew it a little bit more conventionally, closer to the negative side. Now, if these are indeed point charges, the way I've sort of drawn them here, or at least small spots, it should not look like that. But then again, you're doing a physics lab, so what are the odds that it actually will come out perfectly? So I just start now, and then let's we'll see about the one straight across. I know ideally it just comes straight over. However, again, I need to draw my the electric field line perpendicular to the equipotential line. And so, obviously, that's not perpendicular. It's going to curve. So it's coming off of this at a right angle to my tangent. Now, so ultimately, I'm trying to get to here. It's not like it veers off and then it goes shooting off to infinity. It does have an endpoint. So I'm going to sort of curve it back, especially since the line is like that. It's a meandering line, 
And there's more than one interpretation for this, other than the fact that it has a starting point, end point, it's perpendicular to my equipotential lines, at least I hope close enough. And since I came out in the middle, I know it's supposed to be you know, relatively straight, straight across, uh, it's sort of stuck to that. Now, what it's really doing in here, yeah, there's some artistic license. But that's one of the reasons I had to do what, seven equipotential lines? is to avoid big gaps like that. The deserts where you can sort of do whatever you want. If I did one down below, I know ultimately, let's go for a different color here just for the, ideally, given two data, given a two point charges or at least spherical symmetric charges, it should look something like that. That's sort of the rough path I'm going to go on. So I come off of this. See, there's my tangent line right there, so perpendicular to that. Still curving. I got this funky thing going on right here, so it's going to have to curve down like that. And it's going to have to then something a little bit like that. Anyway, that would be my approach. Yeah, it might make more sense to come out farther on this one. Still off. Does that help you, Wesley? I think so. I guess I'll find out on Wednesday. <laughs> and uh, it doesn't have to go through certain points. It, it doesn't have to. Yeah. Problems, it? Now, the only point that I, I asked you to go through is whatever your point in is. Point in, got it. And then the rest of the, the, um, the rest of the electric field lines don't have to go through a certain point. Correct. Okay. Can I ask you to reiterate what Daniel was asking about um, earlier about like one charge creates something and two charges creates? Uh, no, if uh, electric, so electric potential energy, okay. and then oh, and then the one charge is electric potential. Okay. Yeah. That was it. Thank you. Okay. And again, in order to have an electric force or electric potential energy, you have to have two charge, at least two charges. Is that the vector side of it? Is that the vector side or no? The potential energy is scalar. Right. Force is the vector side. At this point, Friday's lectures were are posted. Uh, or on YouTube, I should say that way, but the links, I haven't done the links yet. Pop up on my feed, I'm subscribed to you. I'm, on, I'm subscribed to you, so I'm on it. I popped up. Okay. I, I imagine along with the entire fan base is going, ooh, another physics video. <laughs> I hope this is a class lecture. <laughs> this is a class. And in the last 48 hours, another 22 views of my elliptical video. You're actually getting commercial on yours. You're getting uh, sponsored. I got uh, around 1,500 views of one of my videos. It'd be nice if it were a physics video instead of a math video, but you know. <laughs> Other questions right now?
right, so let's take a look at a specific case. Similar to this one right here. I want them closer. I think we, well, we definitely talked about the electric field coming from a single plate. We did the electric field between the two plates, right? No, actually, we talked, we talked about it. We got the formula for the electric field between? I think a lot of people talk about this, like uh, volts. Right, now this would have been earlier. All right. So it's. I feel, I'm feeling, feeling pretty sure we did a single plate. If I have an infinite, infinite sheet of charge, infinite plane of charge. The electric field at this point, so let's assume this has some charge density of sigma, surface charge density, so if I take any bit of area of this plate here, this is a side view for those who missed it, it's a side view, any bit of area that the charge is proportional to the size of that area. And I'm using sigma to represent the surface charge density. We use Gauss's law to show what the electric field was at this point right here. And it'd be really cool if someone remembered what it was. I'll give you a moment to look through your notes. That's the electric field from a point charge. And by the way, if you use that point charge formula that Daniel just said for something that's not a point charge or can't be assumed to be a point charge, then I tend not to give any credit. So an infinite sheet of charge here or a very large sheet of charge, please do not use the point charge formula. Is it KQ1, Q2 divided by R? No, uh, two things there. One, it's an electric field we're looking for here, and electric field, only one charge required. Right. And two, Q, the charge per unit area is a constant in, on, in this particular problem. What value for Q you would use is very difficult to establish because the value of the charge on the plate depends on the size of area we're taking. The only formula I have is for the electric flux, I think, where you might be of sigma over um, epsilon sub naught. So that's what I wrote next to this when we wrote it. All right, we used electric flux to find it. Uh, right here, you're on the right area. Oh, I have 2E equals sigma over epsilon sub naught. Therefore, E is? Uh, uh, sigma over 2 epsilon sub naught. All right. And the absolute sub naught again assumes free space that we have pretty much a vacuum around the plate. The actual value for the permittivity of air is so close to that of free space that we will assume that air is close enough to a vacuum. Especially when you're doing a lab. And the vacuums are hard to come by. Or I will say that the difference between the permittivity of, of free space and of air is not where you're going to find your problems. All right, so we have the electric field is sigma over two epsilon sub naught from a single plate. And if Q is positive, it goes away. If, or if sigma is positive, it, the electric field goes away. If it is negative, it goes towards. Same as before, the electric field goes away from positive towards negative. And there'd also be one over here. And as pointed out before, the distance you are from this infinite plate is irrelevant. It does not show up in the formula anywhere. It canceled out when we actually did the, well, actually it didn't show up when we were doing 
the derivation. So now when I take two plates, this of surface charge, uniform surface charge density of sigma and this of negative sigma, we are going to make the assumption that they are equal magnitude, just opposite, not in direction, but in sign. They're additive inverses of one another. If sigma is a positive number, then my electric field goes away from it. So the green arrows represent the electric field coming from the left plate. The right plate's negative, and so the electric field goes towards it. And you can go for a better stunning visual effect there. So the purple lines represent the electric field from the negative plate. I know the purple, the value of the electric field is, the magnitude, I should say, is sigma over two epsilon sub naught. And for the green, it's sigma over two epsilon sub naught, it's the magnitude. The negative sign is a directional thing. We've taken that into account already by just drawing the arrows in the correct direction. So now, what is the total electric field out here to the right of the right plate? Zero. To the left? In the middle. So in the middle, it's sigma over epsilon sub naught. So if I have two infinite plates, then the electric field in between is a constant over epsilon naught is the value of it. <clears throat> so reality is infinite plates are hard to come by. So instead, the question is, is it close enough so that we can make that assumption? And generally, yes. So if we have some distance between these, and we'll go for something clever like the letter D for the distance between them. So if D is small in comparison to the square root of the area of the plate, in other words, if this is a 10 meter by 10 meter plate, then if D is much less than 10 meters, then we can assume infinite plate approximation. Which is pretty darn convenient. So typically in problems like this, I give you square plates. So if this is a 10 meter by 10 meter plate, then, and much less than, the quick and dirty rule of thumb is if it's less than 10% of whatever value you're comparing it to. So if, in this particular case, if D is less than one meter, then we're gonna make that assumption. We're making that assumption for the area in between the plates. So this union right here. Now, in terms of how close, how far off is this from reality again? Well, similar to the drawing that I did at the very beginning, 
my equipotential lines are going to be curved on the outside here and relatively flat in the middle. They should not be touching. So as long as the theory are parallel, that's a pretty decent approximation of constant electric field. And this region right here is where it sort of falls apart, but not enough for us to care. <clears throat> All right, so what can we do with this? Well, let's introduce one more rule. I do this, I always wonder, I feel like I misspell it every time, like van der Graaff. There's two A's in graph. This might be in the other one where I have it. Kirchhoff might have another H in there, so I'm not seeing it written any particularly quickly at this point. Off. Off. All right. Again, this might be another reason. Here calls with voltage rule. Also known as here calls. Now the essence. The essence of it is that the electric potential is, is path independent, or the electric potential difference is path independent. So if I take a point here, it has some, there's some electrical potential at this point. <clears throat> if I go on some journey around some path, and I end up back where I started, what is the difference in the electric potential? from the beginning to the end. The same. The same sign. What is the difference? Zero. 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 Yeah. So if I take any, go at any point, if I come back to the same point, the voltage or potential difference between that point and itself is zero. So if I have a 12 volt battery, so first off the notation here, it comes down to what I draw and then there's the purest view. When you've got the big side and the small side, this, this is telling us two things. One, this is telling us it's a DC power supply, or I should say DC, you know what? I'm going to go with DC power supply, and then I'll talk about why some people disagree. The big one is the plus side, and the small one is the minus side. So if you have a, just pull out a battery, you see there's a plus and a minus, that would be represented on paper as the big side, which is the plus side, and the negative, which is the minus side. If you need some memory trick, a plus sign requires twice as much ink as a minus sign. So the one that requires more ink is the plus side. So if I go across, if it's a 12 volt battery, and I go from this point right here, we'll call that point A, to this point right here, point B. So we start at A, go to B, what is my voltage or potential difference between those two points from A to B? So I have a battery here, and I'm going from point A to point B. What is my change in the electric potential as I go from A to B? 
It's a much simpler question than you're thinking. K minus B. K minus B. It's always final minus initial. Is it negative 12? If I'm going from a negative to a positive, oh. gut feeling, if I go from negative to positive, do I gain or lose? You gain. You gain. So therefore, it would be positive. It is positive 12. So from A to B, I gain 12 volts. If I go from B to A, you lose 12 volts. Yeah, so my, my voltage would be negative 12 volts going against the battery. Now, actually, before I hook it into the plates over there, if, oh, sorry. Didn't mean to start with the word if. The reason why the purists would disagree with this being a power a power supply is that, or a battery, is that they would claim that a battery requires multiple power cells. This is a power cell. A battery has more than one. And so properly, a battery should be listed at like this, where you've got more than one of these units to it. If you are one of the purists in that, just sort of let it roll. I'm nitpicky about other things. This is one of the things that I'm still gonna write it this way because it's left writing. I did have someone who worked in the field and he sort of cringed every time I did that. I thought of the power supply. Question. Okay, so is this like, I guess I'm just struggling to visualize where this is happening, like this, like where it's moving like positive 12 volts or like negative 12 volts? Is this like within the battery or is it? Say within the battery. All right, so I guess let's drop back for just a second and potentially you'll ask your question again, but let me give slightly more background at this point. Okay. What voltage is it? Voltage. I'm gonna go ahead and say it. Uh, later on you might go, wait a second, that's not right. It's close enough for what we have right now. The potential difference across a battery, this 12 volts here, sometimes was originally referred to as the EMF. It originally stood for electromotive force because it was believed that what this 12 volts is, is it's the impetus which gets a charge to start to move around the circuit. So the bigger this number is, the more push there is, the more current you're gonna get, because you're gonna get more charge flowing. They later realized it's not a force. And so officially, from what I've read, EMF does not stand for electromotive force anymore. EMF stands for EMF. Its roots are electromotive force, but it's not a force. Now I still will find sources that say EMF stands for electromotive force, but I don't believe that's the case. This is sort of an ideal voltage. The battery says 12 volts, that you can treat that as the EMF. I don't get much into the difference between the actual voltage and the EMF, so that's good enough for 152. If you get into electrical engineering, you'll get into the distinction between the two and then worry about it. The big difference is the fact that all batteries have some internal resistance and it never really quite potential difference between it. The EMF does not take into account internal resistance to the battery. So what the voltage is here is uh, a measure of how, how much drive there is to get the electrons to move. And now I forgot your question again. I was just asking if this um, like charge to get an electron to move, if that was happening like within the battery, if, it, if it's like ah. in a circuit or right. So the battery, very crudely, I guess the plus and minus for a nine volt battery. You basically have a barrier right here and you have a whole bunch of positive charges out here. Basically it's, they're whatever the element happens to be missing some electrons. So it's ultimately positively charged on this side. 
And here you've got a bunch of excess electrons, or at least electrons that can be easily stripped away. So right now, that's the way it sets up. And in a nice ideal world, it would stay like that forever. Once I connect the two leads of the battery, the electrons now have a path to get over to the positive charges because this barrier in the classic battery is impenetrable. What the heck, I'll throw the word ideal. The classic ideal battery, it's impenetrable, charges will not go through. So once the electrons, again, they hate each other, they're trying to get away from each other, you've now given them a path to get over to where they wanna be. And so the electrons will start to move. So first off, this electron over here will move in there, creating a hole, and then another electron will pop into that hole, and another electron will pop into that hole, and eventually the hole will get over to here, and then this electron will move into that hole, and these electrons will start to come out. Wait, why is it creating holes? Like because this electron, the electron that's closest to over here, the electron in the wire, goes, ooh, a whole bunch of positive charges. Boom. Let me go, yeah, let me get like, okay. Yeah, and so now there's a gap where it used to be. Oh, okay, okay, okay. So then they just like keep, okay. Yeah, so it is possible, I, you know, the speed at which the electron moves and an electron moves along the wire is actually rather slow, but you get current immediately because all the electrons start moving. Yeah. Uh, we're talking on the order of the, the time from, from nothing hooked up to it, to my first touching of it, uh, we're talking on the order of a microsecond for the, all the electrons to start moving. So, so you ask whether it's happening inside the battery or not. Um, that 12 volts is an indication of, in essence, how much drive there is for these electrons to escape and get over to here. Right, okay, that's fine. Now rechargeable batteries, this barrier right here is not as solid. And so when you hook it up to a rechargeable battery, it basically starts to strip electrons off of here and send them back over to this side. Now over time, this, barrier degrades to the point where the electrons can flow much more easily back and forth between the two, and at that point, your rechargeable battery doesn't hold a charge really. Other questions right now? All right, so I'm calling it a battery, calling it a DC power supply. Oh, the DC part, direct current. In direct current, the charges basically flow one way. That my electrons are gonna be flowing in the way I've drawn it right here. I guess it'd be counterclockwise the way I've drawn it. In alternating current, which is the other way, is the electrons basically move one way, then moves back, because it just goes back and forth. That's AC. That's AC, yeah. So alternating current, it alternates the direction. DC, it only goes one way. In general. In the next chapter, we'll talk about you know, what that actually means. And just as a side note, AC power supply is symbolized by a circle with a little sine wave in it. That, is, that comes up in five chapters. That, that's something we'll be hitting late March, early April. Was your question answered? Yes. Okay. All right, so I have this 12 volt battery. I go from A to B, it gains 12 volts. If I go back to A, so if I go A to B, back to A, my potential difference total is zero, which means because I gained 12 volts there, going back, I lose 12 volts, I'm back at zero. Would that then be an AC power supply though, if it goes back? Oh, it's like we got two different things going on here. One is the direction that the current actually flows, and two, it's, I'm just, I'm just starting at some point. I can, I can go from any point on the circuit to any, in any direction I want to go. I'm not claiming that the charges move back and forth. All I'm claiming is that I've gone back and forth. Okay. I now hook it up to my two parallel plates over there. 
So I start from A and I gain 12 volts when I go to B. This time for going from B to A, I go around this way. Now we've already established, if I go back, end up back where I started, my total voltage is zero. Which means if, since I went in this direction, if I gain 12 volts going this way, what happens when I cross this? You have like an extra 12, yeah. I started here, I gained 12. I know when I get back here, I have to be at zero. Drops the ball. You lose the 12. You lose the 12. Going in this direction, so it's minus 12 volts going that way. This is what Kirchhoff's rule is, voltage rule, is that if I start at any point and I go around a circuit, I should end up back to zero. So whatever I gain going across some elements, I'm going to lose going across others. Now let's think about what happens on these plates. When as soon as I hook the plates up to the battery, I got the electrons moving. This might book. The electrons don't exist. So my electrons start to move this way, because this is the negative side, that's where the electrons are stored. And the electron basically start to pile up onto here. I get an electron on this side, and it chases an electron away. So now this is positively charged. Another electron shows up here, and another electron goes away, and I'm left with another positive charge. And it will keep doing it. I'll keep getting the electrons piled up on one side, and same amount of positive charge on the other side. And I create that situation where I have two plates really close to each other, where one of them has a surf surface charge density of sigma, and the other one is negative sigma. Now, the more char negative charges I get on this plate, the harder it is to get another charge onto it. Because again, the electrons hate each other. They hate each other down here. They're being driven to get to the positive charge over this side, but you now have these uh, negative charges here that, frankly, don't really want newcomers. But they'll still take them as long as they're room. As long as the plate's big enough, you, you can still get a whole bunch of electrons on it. This right here is a parallel plate capacitor. Notice how it all fits together here. When I went, came across the battery from A to B, I gained 12 volts. When I went from B to A across the capacitor, actually, whatever path I took, I'm going to lose 12 volts. Well, when I, if I look at my capacitor here, my right side is negative, my left side is positive. So when I go from the positive to negative side, I lose 12 volts. And in general, you can make the claim, if I go from a high positive to a negative side, I'm going to lose potential. Same thing down here. If I go from the positive to the negative side, I lose potential. I go from negative to positive, I'm going to gain potential. As you can imagine, a capacitor is basically there to store charge. Why would you want to store charge? Well, if you need, Daniel? Timer. Four? Uh, any like app, like uh, sensitive like equipment, you might want to like, hold the charge. Why would you need to hold the charge? Hmm? Why would you need to hold the charge? Uh, that, that's one of the examples I, I've seen it used for. Or or not charge. Charge or not. So typically, the difference between, because in a battery you can hold a lot of charge too. Oh, that's true. Capacitors, generally, you want, you've got a lot of charge stored. Uh, Zach, what were you saying? Maybe you need more. Like, the more the hold, yeah. Will this slowly hold it for a longer time? Right. 
Wait, so that's the thing about the capacitor, like it's slowly like dissipating over time, doesn't it? It, it does. Okay. Uh, it, the battery is a better way of holding it for a longer period of time. Capacitor is used if you need a charge very quickly. It holds it and it, and yes, it will dissipate over time, but you, you hold it there and then if you need a huge amount of current all flowing okay. at once, huge amount of charge flowing all at once, that's a good reason for a capacitor. Because a battery, yeah, it's gonna take its dear sweet time for the charge to come out. But capacitor, you store a bunch up and then you discharge it all at once. The, the nicest case that, I, that I've seen in everyday life, flashes for cameras. Disposable cameras can also be turned into tasers. Tasers do the same thing. And there are plenty of videos out there which talk about how to create a taser from a flash, from a disposable camera. I think I've said it before, but if you do it and experiment on yourself, please don't video it and put it on YouTube. Because it's very easy to discharge this. All you need, because you have all these electrons still trying to get away from each other. They're, they're in sort of a, a stasis here because they're not quite ready to jump yet, but you know, the simplest thing can jump them across. So if I have a, you know, I have a piece of metal here and I hit a switch and, this, and the metal comes down and connects it, suddenly, boom, it will discharge like that. Of course, same can be said with a battery, but battery, I did have a battery fall over and hit a truck and the battery fell over and hit the side and discharged like that, died instantly. Uh, however, with the capacitor, you can charge it back up again. Dead battery, a lot more difficult to do on the spot. All right, so I now have a voltage across here of 12 volts, negative, positive, or negative, depending upon which way I go. I have some charge on here, negative Q, some charge on here, Q. The reason I can get away with just using Q instead of sigma is that these are finite size plates. So let's say it has some area A. And so sigma is Q divided by A. So one other thing I need to do in here, but we'll finish this line of thinking. My electric field strength and again, when they say strength, I'm just looking for the magnitude. My electric field strength, that I know is sigma over epsilon sub naught in between them, which is just u over a epsilon sub naught. And the thing that I should have introduced before I did this is this idea of capacitance. Symbolized cleverly by the letter C. So I have these two plates here. They have some physical size. They're some physical distance apart. There's something physically in between them. Right now, the way I've drawn it, there's nothing in between them. But in reality, there's going to be something in between them. If I double the voltage of the battery, what's that going to do to the charge on the plates? That feeling? It'll double it. It'll overload it somehow. Sorry. As if, like, if you double the charge, wouldn't it overload that side because there wouldn't be as much room for the electrons in the proton? Yeah. All right, so now you get into what is known as the dielectric strength. There is a point at which it there'll be so much charge that you've pushed onto this. Because if I double the voltage, that means I've doubled the push or the double, double the drive to get these electrons to move. I will double the charge on this plate. In reality, there is a point at which suddenly it will spark and there'll be so much charge on this side, it will jump the gap, in which case the capacitor's pretty much done. So we will assume we have not reached that point yet. So, this physically has not changed in my scenario, but we double the, double the voltage of the battery, we double the charge, and there's this ratio of charge to voltage that is what is officially capacitance. Charge 
for voltage. This also brings in the just lovely idea that we now have a capital C that does not mean coulombs, but means capacitance. And speaking of which, let's take a look at units. Unit of capacitance, that's SI unit, would be the unit of charge over the SI unit of the electric potential. What is the international standard unit of charge? From 1.602 times 10 to the negative 60. So close. Uh, looking for just the unit part, I think negative 19 is what you're going for. That's the fundamental charge of, well, I think we just call it the fundamental charge. Right. Looking for the units though. You just coulombs? Yep, coulombs. Well, I definitely overshot that. No, no, no. <laughs> I appreciate you going for it though. And the international standard units of voltage? awkward looking equation here where I've got a C on both sides of the equation. This recognize this is units of capacitance and this is coulombs per volt. However, coulombs per volt is too much for physicists to write. And so coulomb per volt is a farad. And one of those quirky little uh, times in which the unit is named for somebody, but his name is not Farad. For whom is this named? Here we go. <laughs> uh, Carl Farad Gauss. No, not Gauss. Faraday. The A Y was too much for them. Is it just one R? Like it's S A R A D? Yes. Capital. But you have to do capital F, right? Cap the unit is a capital F. Okay. The the word farad is, you know, it's like any noun. <laughs> Capitalize when appropriate and lowercase when appropriate. Capacitance also is a lowercase c, but for some reason I just put a capital C there. So if I take my scenario here, uh, somewhat redrawing what I have over there. If this is a three farad capacitor, which by the way is a huge capacitor, I got my 12 volt battery here. Uh, let's say that these plates are Uh, we'll make them huge, 10 meters by 10 meters. The gap between them will make 0.1 meters. Very significantly smaller than 10 meter by 10 meter plate. My height's still a little under two meters, so picture five of these plus some, and then these are 10 centimeters apart. I wanna know what's the electric field in between. So I have my voltage there, I have my capacitance, so I can figure out the charge that's acting on this plate. I know that capacitance is, actually by definition, charge divided by the voltage, so therefore Q is equal to my capacitance times my voltage, which is three farads times 12 volts. Officially, the 12 volts is not because this is 12 volts, but because across here is 12 volts. Now, indirectly, yes, this 12 volts causes this to be 12 volts here. Because I gain 12, lose 12. Or lose 12, gain 12, depending on which way you want to go. Voltage in the formula here, capacitance is always a positive number. So that's why I'm not worried about, is it 12 volts or negative 12 volts? It's for the formula, 
it's positive. Elementary school multiplication. So 36 and then whatever the Farad Should be Coulombs. Farad volts is also a correct answer, but Coulombs. It's a simpler one. The advantage of sticking to the international, international standard is that I don't have to think through what the final units are. Oh, it's charge capacitance. Or, sorry, Coulombs. So now, what's the surface charge density? Well, surface charge density is charge divided by area. So that's 36 coulombs divided by the 10 meter by 10 meter plate, 100 square meters. So I get a surface charge density of 0 0.36 coulombs per square meter. My electric field between the plates is sigma over epsilon sub naught, because I have nothing in between these plates. And so that's 0 0.36 coulombs per square meter divided by this constant, 8.85 times 10 to the negative 12 coulomb squared per newton meter squared. We get some huge value. Again, it's a very large capacitor. I have four point zero seven times ten to the tenth. And then finishing it up. Um, Newton's per coulomb, coulomb. Stop. <laughs> One of those two by the other. if I doubled the distance between the two plates? How would our answer change? Still well within the infinite infinite plane of charge approximation. The decrease? All right. How would it, where in the math would it change? I should go up this is in the numerator, it's directly a proportional weight to double. Wait, so I, I double the size of the gap and the area would increase. We didn't use it in any of these calculations, did we? We did not. Oh yeah. As long as we're within that infinite sheet approximation, changing that distance is not going to change the situation. Say like distant, if distance is significantly less than the square root of area? Yeah, the area is 100 square meters and d is 0.1. Oh. Okay. So square root would be 10. So 0.1 is significantly less than 10. Okay. 0.2 is still significantly less, going by the 10% rule. Will we ever have a problem where it is not less than 10%? Not for a parallel plate capacitor. Even 252, I don't do that. Questions to hear, because I'm about to change the problem. All right, so we got our capacitor hooked up to it. We charge it up completely. We found the charge on it to be 36 coulombs. So I've got now 36 coulombs on here. I'm sorry, negative 36 coulombs on that side, 36 coulombs on this side. We assume that it is not sparked across.
And now, through the magic of an eraser, I'm going to remove the battery. So I've charged up the capacitor, and then I've taken the battery out. In reality, this is incredibly hard to do. Because once I remove the battery, in my nice ideal case, the charge stays there. Because all I've done is just remove what's driving it. Because the, the capacitor is already charged, removing the battery shouldn't do anything. In reality, as soon as I, as soon as there's that small little disconnect from the, the wire to the battery, it's probably going to spark and you're going to discharge. So it is possible to do, but I tried doing it just by jerking it really quickly. It does not work. My hands are too slow. We're talking on the order of we need to break the connection and get them far enough away within the order of a microsecond. So in our nice ideal world, we're going to disconnect the battery and it's going to stay charged. My electric field hasn't changed because my charge hasn't changed. I'm now going to double the distance between them. So I've got 36 coulombs on here, negative 36 coulombs on there. The distance between them is 0.2 meters. I'm also assuming the nice ideal that we are not losing charge into the air. We're going to pretend that this takes place someplace that is so incredibly dry, there is no humidity. I was watching something the other day, oh, the chef show, and they were talking about, you know, you don't throw away stale bread. You know, you can use it to make croutons and a couple other things. And my wife commented, she said, yeah, in the South, you don't ever really get stale bread. I mean, it goes from basically edible to moldy. <laughs> Though apparently there are some places with low humidity. All right, so now the question is, what is the voltage between them? So we have a set voltage. No, oh, battery is still there. All right. So we have a set battery there. That was ten centimeters apart for the two plates. Uh, one other relationship we need to take a look at is the relationship between the electric field and the potential difference between these two plates. And so, if we think about that voltage. A hand waving version of this potential. The voltage is just the change in potential energy divided by some test charge. The change in potential energy is just the conservative work that's being done, which is force times delta x divided by some test charge. And then force divided by the charge is? Force divided by the charge is what? So this is just the electric field times delta x. Now a hand wave, I haven't worried about the signs right here. Uh, I want to do a little bit of a hand wave here, or at least think through what the signs are. I know the electric field going in that direction. I know the electric field goes in that direction given my two plates goes from positive to negative. I know my voltage is increasing going the other way. So going this way, my voltage is positive. So if I'm looking at a change in at a displacement, if I go in the direction of the electric field, when I do E times delta X, is this gonna be a positive or negative number? If I'm going from left to right, The, negative, right? the electric field goes towards the negative. I'm saying if delta x, so if this is my electric field here, that we're good with. Yeah. Delta x is whichever direction I decide to go in. Right. So if I take my delta x in the same direction as my electric field, 
Is the dot product positive or negative? Yeah. So that's positive if I'm going in the same direction as the electric field. But my voltage would be negative. Right. So properly, delta V is equal to negative E dot delta X. So think it through the negative sign as opposed to playing strict adherence to the map. So sometimes I'll refer to this as the N equation. If we don't worry about sign, then it's just the electric field strength times the distance between the plates. Therefore, while it's hooked to the battery, my voltage is set. Doesn't matter what I do with the plates, the voltage is still 12 volts across here. But if I now separate the plates, in other words, I double the distance, what does that do to my electric field strength? That decreases the electric field strength. If you, wait, yeah. well, voltage stay the same then? Voltage is, voltage is the same, but I'm doubling, I'm doubling D. Right, so that increases and then electric field decreases, but voltage will still be the same. Right, because it's hooked to a battery. Okay. If it's not hooked to the battery, that's not the case. But if it is hooked to a battery, then it is. So I double the distance, I cut the electric field in half more specifically. So what does that tell me about the charge on the plates? If my electric field gets cut in half. There's less charge. Half as much, more specifically. Oh, sorry, yeah. So we have a couple of equations here that we're playing with. We have the, this capacitance which is the charge divided by the voltage. We have that the voltage is equal to the negative electric, negative dot product of the electric field with the displacement. We have the electric field in the parallel plate capacitor is sigma, the magnitude is sigma over epsilon sub naught, or sigma over epsilon if I have some material in between. And my last one. Oh, I missed it. It is U over N. Let's combine these two. Or let's combine some of this. This is true for any capacitor. Let's, let's actually talk about when things are what. So any capacitor, this is true. This is true. This simplified formula is true if the electric field is constant. This is true for the parallel plate, parallel plate capacitor. If infinite plate approximation is valid. And nothing in, nothing between the plates. And then this is true. Again, same approximation is valid, and there's an insulator between the plates. So now combining them, or combining this under our nice parallel plate capacitor, my capacitance is the charge. Well, the charge, since it's, we have a plate, we're assuming a uniform charge distribution. So that's just sigma times the area of the plate, divided by my voltage, which is just E delta X or ED. I'll stick with D because I use D more often for that distance between them. lost oh and then e is let's assume there's an insulator in between 
So that becomes sigma A over sigma over epsilon minus D. Sigmas cancel out, and what I'm left with is A times epsilon over D. So this with a parallel plate capacitor with that approximation. If there's no if there's nothing in between the two plates, it's called a dielectric. If the dielectric's not between the two plates, then taking the epsilon sub zero. Now, one last tweak to this. The permittivity of free space, 8.85 times 10 to the negative 12. The permittivity for paper, then you start getting into, all right, what is it? It's gonna be something times 10 to the negative 12, maybe something times 10 to the negative 11. They decided to, instead of writing all that stuff out, decided to come up with, let's use another letter. It is a kappa. Well, it's a lot like a K, but it's not a K, because we use K for too many things. A kappa, which is the dielectric constant which is the dielectric, uh, sorry, the permittivity of that particular medium divided by the permittivity of free space. So given that equation there, the permittivity is just kappa times epsilon sub zero. So my equation for the parallel plate capacitor is kappa A epsilon sub naught over D. connected it with some of the stuff that we've done. If it's just a simple capacitor circuit. I'll say single capacitor, single parallel plate capacitor circuit. So battery capacitor. If the battery's connected, or whatever the DC power supply is, if battery connected, voltage of capacitor is set. So it doesn't matter what you do to the capacitor, that voltage is set, assuming we don't overcome the dielectric strength, in other words, that point at which it suddenly will spark, which we won't. If battery is not connected, charge on plate is set. Because on that first test, there'll be some manipulation problem where I give you a parallel plate capacitor, I'll give you the specs, and then I'll, some questions I've asked in the past are, what would you need to do to double the capacitance? Or how can you double the capacitance but keep the charge the same? Things like that. And we'll go through some examples Friday. Seems like there was something else I was going to do before we were done, but it's gone, so. You were going to talk about um, what happens in a perfect world when you do disconnect that battery, but you answered it for us, like the charge would be set, which yeah. makes sense because there's no more, like there's no battery to do for anything. Right, right. <laughs> and in part of our ideal world, it doesn't bleed off into the atmosphere and there's no sparking. Spark would indicate a loss of charge, right? Because that's it. Yeah, that, that's the electrons shooting through the air. Right. And as has been definitely heavily implied, we are assuming electrons exist.
Electrons? We are assuming electrons exist. Maybe in a real life or in our test environment. <laughs> what in, like, in real life or in our test? In our test ideal. It gets really funky because you know we think, tend to think of electrons as these little part, tiny little particles that are moving, but it doesn't actually behave always like particles. Sometimes it behaves like a wave, like there's just some sort of oh, yeah. nebulous fluid that's flowing. You can have electrons interfere with itself, in essence. But that is something for the end of the course. We'll really get into that detail. If we get there. It's one of those, that bonus material.